Okay. Well, thanks, Dr. Kavoda. And a pleasure being here today. What a greater way to spend a nice minus five degree uh, winter day than looking at some nice ripe strawberries in Ohio. Uh, in Ohio growing in our greenhouses. I'm Brad Burgerford. I'm a horticulture specialist, been with OSU for about going on 27 years, and I'm based out of the Python Research and Extension Center. Uh, we're the southernmost research farm that Ohio State has, and our main goal is to develop specialty crop enterprises for basically we have small acreage farmers. Our biggest crops in southern Ohio for many generations was tobacco, and tobacco now we still have it, but it's down to like 10 farmers that grow lots of acres. So we had came up with other high value specialty crop options, and that's where I do my work. I do field research, greenhouse research, and then bring those to the customers that are interested in diversifying through workshops, field days, and so forth. Some of you may have received messages from me when Dr. Kapoto was putting this workshop on, um, I sent it out to my email list as well. Um, one of the things uh, we have been working on at Piketon since 94 is trying to enhance the strawberry industry in Ohio. Strawberries are a pretty good money maker. Uh, when you look at all the agronomic crops in Ohio, they're in the top 18, which isn't bad because we're not a California or Florida in terms of strawberry production. So we do have a lot of opportunity to continue producing strawberries, but there's a whole lot more opportunity out there to get into strawberry production uh, from a marketing standpoint, which is the most important. Whenever we're looking at diversifying into any of these specialty crops, we got to have the market. And I'll share with you a little bit of data that shows we do have a lot of marketing potential uh, here in Ohio. Uh, like I said, we've been growing strawberries for many generations. Uh, going back to the 1900s, uh, before California and Florida were strawberry kings, uh, we had almost 9,000 acres. And I'll show you how our acreage has fluctuated uh, over that time frame. Ohio has a rich history of growing strawberries. We were one of the first states to ship strawberries by, by a train car, refrigerated train car, packing it full of ice and moving to Chicago. Uh, here in Ohio, we're at the heart of it all. We can move produce to all the big cities uh, throughout the U.S. So even back in the 1800s, our strawberry farmers in Ohio were taking advantage of our marketing opportunities that we have, and they were the first to start, start shipping strawberries uh, by rail car. Um, where do we grow strawberries in Ohio? We grow them from the shores of Lake Erie, clear down to the, uh, the shores of uh, the Ohio River and everywhere in between. Just about every county we have strawberries being grown on some amount of acreage. Might be just a couple acres, might be 50 acres, but we do have strawberries grown just about in every county and throughout the entire state. Um, some of the most recent census data back in 2015 uh, we're, we had about 600 acres of strawberries. A uh, pretty good farm gate value. When you look at the wholesale value of those, it's bringing in about 3.9 million. So that's where strawberries fall into the top 18 agronomic crops in Ohio is with that, uh, that farm gate value coming in close to 4 million bucks. Believe it or not, even though we are small acreage in Ohio, Ohio ranks 10th out of the entire U.S. in terms of strawberry production. So even though we're small, we are pretty mighty when it comes from a national perspective. Um, being ranked 10th, I think, is pretty good. Um, and altogether, we have 566 strawberry farms. Now, I was talking to uh, Dr. Kavoto about this a couple weeks ago. I work with strawberry farmers, and some of you I work with throughout the state. I don't think when it comes to the census data, we're collecting all the acreage figures that we have. I know many farmers that have just an acre or two, and they're totally off the grid. They're Amish farmers, Mennonite farmers. They don't participate in USDA programs. They don't get the, the USDA uh, statistics, uh, um, call for statistics, you know, acreage and production and so forth. So really, we're doing pretty good with the stats we have but I think we're losing a lot of those real stats that we have in Ohio. One of our goals in the future is to try to capture more of that and maybe bring up to speed where we really stand in terms of strawberry production in Ohio. But no matter how we look at it, we still have a long ways to go before we reach the full capacity that we could produce. Like I said, you go back to 1900, 9,373 acres of strawberries. Now, sure, we weren't producing a tenth of, in terms of per acre yields that we're producing today. Plus, we didn't have those other states. We didn't have, California wasn't a big king then, Florida wasn't a big king, but we did have, so there's our potential. We could go back to that if everything else falls into shape. But then you can see 
our acreage has been actually dropping off a little bit. We had a little bip, uh, blip in um, acreage there in 2010, 2011. But the neat thing when you look at actual production, our yields have stayed about the same. So what it means is farmers are growing less acres, but they're producing more yield on less acres, which is our goal as, as farmers because we make more money doing things that way. Um, Here's where it shows where work that Dr. Kubota is doing and work that we're doing down at Piketon and all the other university folks that are doing research to try to increase our marketing periods or our harvest periods we can on strawberries. This is where it falls in. When you look at the consumer data, how many pounds of strawberries are being consumed just by Ohioans? In Ohio, we're looking at 89 million pounds of strawberries is what's so we are eating. No matter who's growing them, that's what our Ohioans are consuming. When you look at those 2015 estimates on those 600 acres, we're only producing 1.8 million. So look at the opportunities we have as Ohio farmers to grow one of the top 18 ag commodities in terms of value in the state. Look how many pounds that we could be producing. And I'm so glad that we have Dr. Cavoto because we haven't really had anybody in Ohio. I've been with him for 27 years. We haven't had anybody with her research background, her knowledge to do things to these strawberries, tweak them, the physiology of the plant, trying to make it produce more, trying to grow strawberries in the middle of January. Um, she can do it. So I'm so glad that she's on our staff here and that we're going to partner together to try to come up with some more production opportunities, whether it's plastic culture whether it's high tunnels, whether it's low tunnels, whether it's greenhouses, whether it's a combination of all of them, um, I think we can, we're not going to capture the 89 million, but I'd like to at least capture a few more million pounds of that and keep those jobs and keep that money here in Ohio. Why should San Filippo Produce right here at the Produce Terminal in Columbus calling me all the time wanting local? They have a buy local program want local strawberries and can't get them, so they got to go to California, they got to go to Florida, they got to go somewhere else. Let's keep that money right here uh, within the state. If we can grow the estimated 87 million pounds, we could bring in 150, close to 150 million of extra money into the state, not counting all the jobs and all the supplies and the soil and everything else that we're buying to grow these crops. Uh, we could really turn some money in the state. Ohio is home to a lot of big strawberry buyers. I mean, smuckers. Smucker folks have been to our field days uh, down at Pike, and I've had strawberry field days over the years. I don't know if one strawberry is used in the smucker strawberry jam that's grown in Ohio. Um, not, not a single strawberry. We are a fresh market strawberry state. So we're not even tapping that processing market. That, that, that 89 million pounds isn't even considering smuckers uses in their strawberry jam. So that's just fresh market retail um, consumption alone. So if we could even tap into the processing industry, there's another, this is gonna, I'm gonna, I could retire in the next couple of years. So this is gonna be in my career, but over, in, over the next 20, 25 years, Ohio could make some good inroads in terms of strawberry production in Ohio and capture some of this economic activity we have. I mentioned San Filippo. We got Sanson Produce up in Cleveland. They're calling me all the time, trying to connect with strawberry growers. I connect them, but it's just for a load or two. They cannot get a full supply of local grown strawberries that they need for their, for their uh, high value uh, produce buyers. So traditionally, Ohio's been a matted row state, June bearing strawberries. We harvest the first, start harvesting the first of June, we end by the end of June. We've always been a three to four week harvest window. A little earlier down south where I am, a little later up north, but basically we're harvesting strawberries in Ohio three to four weeks. We've changed that. Um, usually we begin down south on matted rose strawberries around Memorial Day, finish up in northern Ohio first, second, third week of July. However, some of the work, I started doing some uh, plastic culture work. Work with Dr. Barkley Poling down in North Carolina. He moved North Carolina from a total mat row state to a plastic culture state. Just by doing that, he doubled his, his production per acre and he doubled his market window. That was one of my goals and we did that. We did the research. Again, can't do it without our funders, 
My main funders have been the Ohio Vegetable and Small Fruit Research and Development Program that all fruit and vegetable growers just pay a couple bucks an acre into this program. Then folks like me and Shari and other people can apply for funding, and they supported us in that. I'm glad they did because now we doubled strawberry production in Ohio. Just those folks that adopted plastic culture, we've went from a four-week season to an eight-week season, and a new technique, day neutral production, where we harvest in the four months. We have techniques now that growers have adopted that we can actually go up to four months of harvest once we get into the day neutral summer production. That's not using tunnels, greenhouses, and so forth. So we've come a long way, but we have a lot more work to do to develop these uh, production techniques can, that can help extend our marketing season. Just real quick, uh, when we do talk plastic culture strawberry, it's a very high intensive production system. Very expensive to get started, but when you look at the figures, we can double, close to triple production compared to matted row, and the profits are really the last year. I don't think we're gonna have a good crop this year. This minus 10 uh, sort of hurt us, I do believe, but last year was the best year for my plastic culture strawberry growers that they've had since we've been doing this in 98, pushing over two quart per plant. And like I said, they're all, most of our farmers are retail farmers, so they're selling these for five, six dollars a quart. Easton Market up here at the farmer's market, six bucks a quart. Pearl Alley Market, five bucks a quart. All you can, all you can take in there, just lines of people buying strawberries retail for that price. So with plastic culture, you don't need near the acres that we used to need when we were growing June bearing matted row production. Um, what's also nice with plastic culture? Matted row, we plant this April, May, we'll harvest next May or June. With plastic culture, we plant usually around Labor Day, and then we go ahead and we start harvest. Down in southern Ohio, we're picking the last week of April, but usually the first week of May we start harvesting. So we don't have our money tied up. We don't have our you know, land tied up. We can rotate crops a lot quicker. So that's another thing with uh, plastic culture. But like I said, it is a high cost of production. It's going to cost you fifteen, twenty thousand. We can tweak that a little bit in terms of all the input costs but the high returns. I mean, two quart per plant, 17,000 plants to the acre at five bucks a quart. Do the math, it's looking pretty good for my farmers. When we did this research back in 98, we went into it as an annual plastic culture system. So we planted in September, harvest in May and June, either tear them up or double crop them. And most of my farmers are coming back in double cropping pumpkins, winter squash, cucumbers, um, Brussels sprouts. I have one farmer grows 20 acres of plastic culture strawberry, kills them all down with Roundup, burns, uh, mows them down, transplants Brussels sprouts within a month later, and just finished harvesting Brussels sprouts. He usually is going to the 1st of January, but he ended at the, the end of November this year. But lots of cold crop opportunities, cauliflower, broccoli, can go right into those. So you're not wasting your plastic. We do have techniques, though, those that want to carry them over, but it's not a recommendation just due to the disease aspects. Um, so this is what we're looking at. We can get a pound and a half per plant, 26,250 pounds per acre. We need 35 successful blooms. Survive. Those, those of you may not know, but on plastic culture, our crop is already set. Come Christmas Day, we can cut that plant open, look at it under the microscope, and we can count the number of blooms that are in that plant. The trick is getting that plant to make all those 35 blooms by Christmas and then keeping them alive until we harvest. That's the trick in Ohio is, uh, is frost protection. And this, that's why I said I don't think we're going to have, this was the last polar vortex event back in 2014 and that plant we cut open just within the afternoon of the morning when we were down to minus 20. You put that under a microscope, all the flower buds we're all brown and dead already just from that minus 20 event. We're using winter protection techniques, but for us in Southern Ohio, we don't have the snow. So an ounce and a half of floating row cover can only protect so much. What we want is four inches of snow like Northern Ohio farmers got. You guys are lucky, you got all that snow. Us down South don't have the snow, but we have to, unlike the North Carolina folks, have to um, put up with some of these low temperatures that we had in the state. So that's why we'll never probably be all plastic culture like North Carolina but will be a nice mix of the two because it helps us spread that marketing window out. Another, this is another from the polar vortex event. Remember when a good Friday hit and the temperatures were at 70 and started dropping, they were down to 10 degrees by a good Friday night. Um, 
This is one of my farmers had row covers and ran water for frost protection for three days straight. Got 80% of a crop, believe it or not, but this is the type of work you have to do to manage a crop, a strawberry crop in Ohio and be successful at it. Um, not gonna go much in this, but by a bottom line, on any strawberries, we just need a long period for, for that flower bud initiation. That starts the day we plant them on September 1st, and we do everything we can to keep that plant actively growing right up until either Thanksgiving or Christmas, depending on the weather. A little bit about using other techniques then, not just plastic culture, but we start our first uh, high tunnel. Before they were called high tunnels, we took this old code frame out of a dumpster up at OARDC at Wooster. It was really destined for the scrapyard. I heard about it. We went up with the flat, the, the, uh, the gooseneck and the pickup truck and salvaged this, dump, went into the dumpster, pulled the bows out, and turned this into the first movable high tunnel in the state. It wasn't called a high tunnel then, but we actually can hook tractors of this and drag it around. And we had strawberries in there. We were picking strawberries in February, yes. You can make good yields, you can make a good early production. The trouble is we're growing them on the flat until we can start producing strawberries in the air in these high tunnels, we're not gonna make no money. You can make more money growing indeterminate tomatoes because you're harvesting all that expensive airspace. Now some of the stuff you're gonna see today that Ashari's doing, um, we can actually take some of those techniques, put them into the tunnels, we're harvesting that expensive, uh, expensive airspace. But no matter what we do, high tunnels, low tunnels, comes down to economics. You gotta be able to make some money at that. And that's both of our researches um, also has an economic tie to it because if it's not gonna make y'all money, we really don't wanna uh, try to get you guys adopting techniques that aren't gonna make, make you any money. Um, some of my other farmers have adopted these other high tunnels. This is a more of a cheaper model. It's, it's a three season a hay grove type tunnel. It doesn't have no snow load support, but it does when you pull that plastic on, you can actually get those uh, plants to start blooming two weeks earlier. And so there you can get your harvest about two weeks earlier using those. But if we get into day neutrals and some of the summer production after into July, August, September, October, we have a new pest called the spotted wing Drosophila. And I've had a lot of my farmers that have done the greenhouse or the high tunnel with day neutral production in summertime. Forget that this is a major pest and you'll end up having a bunch of strawberries with maggots crawling out of them and the customers don't like having a strawberry that they buy at the farmer's market, put it in the refrigerator and the next morning there's white worms crawling out of it. So remember, if we go beyond July, we have to manage the spotted wing Drosophila pest. Not tired of picking strawberries yet? You can do like Dr. Kubota's doing. We can actually come up like Elliot Coleman has done over in the East Coast, coming up with a lot of different production techniques. And basically, this is a quote from, from Elliot, just talking how we can adopt some techniques to get into winter or off-season production on any types of fruits and vegetable crops, because there's always somebody that will eat those crops. Um, some of this you'll see today, but uh, I've been a good friend with um, Dr. Fumi Takeda. He is a bear a specialist out of the USDA um, Small Fruit Research Station in Kernysville, West Virginia. Me and him have worked together on lots of things, blackberries, and we've done all kinds of things together. But uh, Dr. Um, Fumi has done a lot of different strawberry production techniques in high tunnels and in greenhouses. So some of the work that we're looking at is actually at these troughs and some of these gutters actually came from his initial work. And so then we can tweak it for our production systems uh, in our seasons here in Ohio. But again, got to come down to that economic feasibility of it. I don't know. Towers, these are done down in Florida, whether they have anything here. I think we have some issues with shading and so forth on these bottom plants, but um, that, that's something we could look at in the future. I have growers growing them in baskets, growing strawberries in, inside their tomato tunnels. They have just hanging baskets growing down. They're not getting a lot of production, but they are getting some strawberries that can go with their early tomato crop. So that's another way you can grow early tomatoes or early strawberries with your early tomatoes. Stackable systems, I think these need to be looked at. We have a lot of folks that have experienced them over the years, but I think they need to be modified a little bit, um, which is what we're working on, trying to modify this production technique. And then maybe we can do some low tunnels. I looked at low tunnels back in 98, 99, and 2000. What was available in them days just would not hold up to our winter events that we have here in Ohio, wind and so forth. But they've come a long way. They've adopted a lot of this in North Carolina. I think we can utilize what, uh, what they've learned there and use some of this new technology here in Ohio. So stay tuned.
stoop labor requirements. If you don't like to bend over, strawberries might not be for you because it takes a lot of skilled, quick, fast, stoop labor to make these strawberries to pay. You can do everything right, have a beautiful crop, but if you don't have the high skilled, quick labor that can get this done and do it for hours and hours on end, especially we get a heat. We get Memorial Day, we get a high heat, and we got all this fruit. Well, usually we'd pick over a week, we'd have to pick over a weekend. So you gotta have the labor to get there. That's the biggest problem we're seeing. Even smuckers have said they're growers out in California. They're paying them $15, $20 an hour to pick strawberries and they still can't get the harvest need to harvest the berries. And when smuckers have been at our field days, they've said we have to come up with some automation in the future if we're gonna continue to make strawberry jam because we just don't have the labor out there to pick the strawberries. So we've been working with this company out of the uh, Dayton Air Force Base called the Adiva Automation. Uh, just a bunch of engineers doing this on the side. But the, we've been testing in our field some of these robotic harvesters that are using optical sensors to determine the ripeness of the fruit. And then they can actually make nice stem berries. They have these clippers on them. They clip the stem berry and they put them into a quart. Then they have another robot that's picking up, got the flat on it and it carries the flat back to the truck. Hey, I don't think we're too far out. Sounds like we're way out there. I'd say within the next 20 years, we need to be here if we're going to continue to grow those strawberries. So with that, lots of opportunities, lots of challenges, but I do believe if you're looking for a money-making crop in Ohio, strawberries are one of them, but it's not going to come out with a lot of investment work um, and risk. You might be better off to go to Las Vegas, maybe. I don't know. But <laughs> But any questions on our work? I do have our website, which has all of our research data from going clear back to 94 on it. If you want to see any of the strawberry work we've done, um, it's on southcenters.osu.edu. If you want to be added to our horticulture mailing list, some of you all got this announcement on our hort mailing list, but if you're not on it, you can register to be on my hort mailing list. And that just tells you when we're having field days and workshops like today. I also do hops. That's probably been my biggest thing I've been doing the last five years is bringing back the hops industry to Ohio. So we always put on an annual hops conference and lots of field days working with our extension agents uh, around the state to put on these uh, regional workshops. So we'll make all those announcements on those uh, email lists. So any quick questions? All righty. Back to you, Sherry.